record. I am Karen Lynch with the School District of Philadelphia. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And I join my colleague, Commissioner Figueroa, in extending to the young people who spoke today a sincere thanks and appreciation for their courage, their willingness to share intimate details, and for their perseverance, and for um, what I know. Um, I, I heard your comments particularly. This is the beginning, this is not the end. This is where we start, this is not where we're going to end up. And I uh, thank you, Councilwoman, for reminding us all of, um, of, of that message because it's extremely important. Thank you for this hearing today and the opportunity to talk about these issues, Councilwoman Kim. And um, with that, I will share just a couple of things. Um, we support the recommendations that have been made by Cynthia Figueroa today. Um, in particular, we very much support opportunities for children to remain closer to home and in fact inside of Philadelphia. We urge that opportunity and we have committed to providing educational services within the facilities or the programs, hopefully programs and not facilities, that are located within the city to support young people. Um, we spend in the school district of Philadelphia a little less than $30 million a year to educate children who are going to locations all across the state and uh, it is um, an uh, investment that we think that if they were closer to home we'd be in a much better position to and they would be in a much better position to receive an education that is um, better than what we think that they are receiving otherwise. We particularly um, want to avoid um, silos, you talked about that earlier, um, we want to be a collaborative organization that works with others. We have found that to be our success in the past and um, currently, and so we are very, very eager. We partner with DHS on a good number of uh, services and programs that are related to ensuring that children receive um, much better services than they do. Um, uh, and we know that, that we can do better. We know that we can make a difference. We also collaborate with CDH, my partner to the left is here, and um, we know we have to do better. Um, I also wanted to share that there is an opportunity in this issue for the state to do much better than what they do right now. Um, we come from a uh, jurisdiction uh, not very far from here in Maryland where the state regulates this process much better um, than is regulated here in Pennsylvania. The state set um, not just licensing requirements, but also uh, funding requirements, salary requirements, charges. And um, that state also monitors the efforts of of providers of service much more closely than what is the experience that we have in Pennsylvania. We know that when the state is involved, the jurisdictions all across the state have a much uh, greater onus and there is greater accountability and responsiveness when we're talking about the courses that are offered, the rates that are charged, um, the conditions that exist, um, the way that children are treated and the experiences they have. So we urge that in your efforts, there's also consideration of increasing um, uh, the, the importance with the state, um, what role they have and what opportunity they have. Uh, the young man who spoke earlier talked about credits and the uh, transfer of uh, credits and what transcripts look like when they come to us. Um, our process in the district, if there's any opportunity to include the credits, um, if there's any opportunity to look at a course title and uh, extend credits, we try and do so too frequently. We don't receive the records. Um, the courses are not courses that are credit bearing, and we see that the experiences that students have is not one where they are taking the courses that are at their level and their ability. Another um, trend that we see is that we'll uh, that students will leave as general education students and come back as special education students. Um, we recognize that this is because the providers of service see an opportunity to increase the rate of um, uh, serving uh, children, and so when that rate is higher, uh, when the student is special education identified, that rate that they receive uh, will be higher. We have in the past few years increased our 
accountability to um, the, the, our, our portion of this effort, which is primarily to pay for the educational services for children that we do not place. Um, and uh, we have done everything from uh, ensuring that, uh, that, that the costs that they are charging are within reason and um, more standardized and um, not for services that have not um, been provided. We recognize that children who are in these facilities across the state um, in instances can be going to an uh, on-ground school, in other instances they can be going to a school within their community where um, they are not familiar with anyone, they are, um, their experience and their backgrounds are very, very different than the people that are there, and it's not a great opportunity. So in closing, I would share that um, this is something that we take very, very seriously. Um, we are positioned to do better um, and to do more than we have in the past that we are um, working very, very closely, as I said, with our partners, and that um, we aim to be a good participant and a good partner in this effort. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Vice Chair, do you have any questions? Good morning. She was. Oh, yeah, that is. So the good news that I've heard is, is that 98% of our young people are in Pennsylvania. Speak to me about the difference between congregate placement and uh, residential placement. And I would ask only that you keep your, your responses tight because I have several and I need to be able to punt the ball to the chairwoman so she can punt it back. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to do my best. Please. So congregate refers to residential placement. So it's a term used for various different kinds. So emergency group homes, those are, are terms that we use when we collectively refer to an out-of-home placement where it's not a home base is when we refer to congregate care. So the, well, is that, are they synonymous? Yeah, so instead of saying institution, group home, emergency shelter, we say congregate care to to unit to apply. There's different levels of care that happen, and there's different uh, things that happen in, in those particular facilities. But um, it, congregate care is, is more of a universal term used for residential placement. Okay. Uh, relying on the testimony offered by the young people, and actually looking back at my own professional experience, where when I worked with the city, I was in the division that was responsible for going out and evaluating programs, providing services. Children. And so, with, with that context, what type of evaluative or evaluation protocols, procedures, standards are in place for anybody taking care of one of our child in congregate care? What, what are the protocols? So, we could send you, because it's an exhaustive list in terms of um, the requirements, um, and there's a few different elements. This is part of uh, the confusion that always. The, the facilities are all licensed by the state, uh, so they are required to meet 3,800 regulations that, um, in which there are also uh, site visits and compliance that happens related to that visit, um, where we have co-funded uh, programs with Community Behavioral Health. We've actually moved to sharing some of our work in terms of providers, um, so we're, I would say we're much better. When you asked earlier what's better now, What's better now is that we work in key partnership with CBH around particular the, the visitation and issues with our congreg or the residential treatment facilities. So what red flags do you get when when, there, when we hear instances in children being locked in a solitary confinement on metal benches? Where is it that where is that fact in reports? Do we get that kind of information from the state? And then what's the consequence of that kind of treatment of young people? So there's um, a, a lot of different ways to answer through this. One is that we do get information directly from the providers. Sometimes we don't get information directly from the providers. There is a requirement that the state is to notify us of things that happen outside of Philadelphia County that may not be brought to our attention. Uh, this is another area I've spoken actually with Council Women you know, quite a bit about is that a number of the facilities that we use are also used by other counties. So there could be an incident that happens with a child that's not from Philadelphia County, but I would still want to know that incident. Positively, yes. Um, right now there's a delay in the notification of a critical incident. Um, we have made it explicitly clear to our providers that uh, we expect to hear from them directly 
and uh, a number of them will provide us um, information as it occurs uh, well before we hear anything from the state. We also work with our provide our, our advocate partners. Um, the defenders will bring things to our attention that they've been made aware of by the children that they serve. Okay, let's drill down. What has been? What are the improvements with regards to the linkages between the school district and uh, uh, DHS? And, and that goes to um, continue to strengthen partnership with the DHS Education Support Center in the school district of Philadelphia. Is there an office, is there a department, are there professionals specifically with the responsibility of, of tracking, monitoring everything that's happening with DHS uh, children and youth so at the school district? Yes, so we have an education support center that is physically located at 440. Uh, it's a pretty sizable unit, and as well as we also have social workers at connected to this unit that are deployed to a number of the schools in the Philadelphia School District and they work to help navigate the issues with um, any children who are in care. Uh, we've, one of the improvements that we've made is that in terms of the initial placement, doing an assessment with in partnership with the school district to determine how we can maintain that child in their school of origin and if we can't, what's the planning for transportation, transfer, etc. when we can stay within the district. Um, and we've been working on improving the process by which when a child is sent to a placement. Okay, so that was not in place two years ago, so that is progress. Let's fast forward. It's 72 months from now, five years from now, Karen Merchett has gone on to her dream gig in Hawaii, okay? <laughs> what do we have in place that ensures that the work that's been done in the Dr. Heiss administration is intact long after uh, those professionals go to Hawaii? Because of this, this happened because of the commitment of the current administration. What systemically is in place to ensure that after your departure, that these new protocols and procedures, that this education support center is in place forever? So for the record, I will share that this is my dream job. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. It's not in my plan just yet to, to move on to something else, but um, in all seriousness, uh, I think it's really important for what I call roads and bridges to exist. There has to be processes that are in place. Um, we talk about um, sharing information. Um, we talk about um, the processes that exist on both sides. Um, the uh, Education Support Center is, in fact, physically located. That does not happen overnight, and it doesn't happen easily. It happens as a result of a process that is um, including a, a, a lease agreement and funding, um, and, funding and a commitment. And even once individuals are co-located, it's absolutely essential that they are sharing the work, sharing the information, and focused on how they are addressing the issues and needs of, um, of, of children um, that we are serving in common. So the short answer to your question is um, that in order for it to be sustainable over time, it's absolutely important to be able to build those roads and bridges and those processes within our systems so that they don't fall apart when one person, two people, three people walk away. I would just add, I would just add that there is an existing memorandum of understanding that outlines a data agreement between the Department of Human Services and the school district and that, like, that lives beyond the existing people who are sitting at the table and it's very much aligned with access to information that folks at the Education Support Center have. So that's like an actual physical live um, document that exists between the two systems that here, regardless of what happens tomorrow, that that's an element that keeps that infrastructure going. Is there a data attached to I can't remember how, if it's renewable on a 10-year basis, okay. or, but it's, it's, an ex, it's not a year-to-year. -year. I'll pass, uh, pass the ball back to Madam Chairwoman. In the cases of the staffers, who engaged in that kind of conduct? What are the consequences? Was that investigated? What happened? Um, so not knowing what particular or talking about uh, an exact case, um, to, when, when we're made aware of the situation, it is required that the staff member involved who is going to be investigated by the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services that there is what's called a plant of safety, and so that staff person is supposed to be removed physically from the physical plant. 
Uh, again, that is something that we work very closely with the state because we've seen uh, some diversion from that um, from time to time. And then there's an actual child abuse investigation done on that staff member. Um, and a, based on the outcome by the state's investigation will lead to, um, in a number of times there have been positions taken in the uh, report that don't necessarily align with I, what, what I would like to see. And so we have told providers that we refuse to pay for that staff person to remain on our contract. In some instances, we're the majority payer of that provider. So that kind of is a clear message. We, we, if they're not found um, indicated of child abuse, we can't tell somebody to fire that staff person, but we can say we, we, will, know, we will not pay for them. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Um, so once again, I just want to acknowledge the work that uh, the three of you in particular have done, Commissioner Figueroa, um, Joan, and uh, Karen. Thank you very much for the work you've done on, on taking a look at this issue. Um, I just want to clarify for Commissioner Figueroa, you know, just acknowledge your support in your testimony about uh, recognizing how complicated this issue is. It's been going on for a very long time. And we have a lot of work to do along, uh, not just within the city end or council's end or the advocacy end, but really as that coalition um, to talk about what it would take to, uh, you know, bring our kids home. And um, I think I heard you, but I just want to make it clear that uh, you have a commitment to, to creating that um, coalition of advocates and city agencies and, you know, potentially others. Um, to see about what we can do to, to take a look at those efforts. Is that correct? Yes, 100%. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank both you and Joan Ernie on your work in shortly after the Wordsworth situation and making sure that you visited all these uh, residential treatment facilities of which um, our young people are held. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, those visits, the uh, assessments that you've seen, and um, some reflections on that. And if, if you could just say your name for the record. Uh, so my name is Joan Ernie, and I'm actually the CEO of Community Behavioral Health, not the commissioner. Uh, commissioner Jones might take some pause on that. So. <laughs> um, uh, so appreciate being here and just want to echo the, the uh, amazing voices of our youth always inspire and uh, I think change what we do. Um, two things I wanted to just highlight. One is that um, I think you hear from all of us a real village approach that it is we have all the same commitments to bring young people back closer to home. We have the same commitment to make it a safe and, and secure environment, to have community options. Um, and to have a future. And I think those are kind of systems goals that we have really worked hard to have a lot of synergy between us and with all our child serving partners. Um, we see our role at times as some of the convening um, to bring folks together for our young people. Um, specifically to follow up on uh, you know, the tragedy at Wordsworth, it really does uh, make us all take stock. Um, and council's request for us to go out to the uh, residential programs we formed a multidisciplinary team. We had young adults um, and family members on the team. They made significant contributions, um, things that we would miss, similar to what you hear here from the young people. They would say, well now, what is that exactly over there? And it turned out it was a quiet room, uh, which we don't permit. Um, so I think it's really you know, tremendous. And when we do our monitoring, trying to include young adults and family members who really have a certain perspective had really made a difference for us. Um, we found that there, as with most things, there were both strengths and challenges at each of the residential programs. We went to visit 18 that were here in the, in the state of Pennsylvania. We don't use many out-of-state uh, resources anymore, which is positive. Um, and most of the, anything that we are using at this point is in New Jersey, so we try to keep kids uh, close to home. And we had a number of findings, and I think there are things that we are actively working on. I think one of the things that we found um, is an uh, issue around workforce, um, and uh, we are making uh, I think strides on trying to pull together with our provider community and our advocates, what is the workforce that we need, and how do we make sure they get trained adequately and really um, are able to be committed to public sector work. 
um, how do we keep them safe um, as, as a, both an employee and also feeling really good about the work and the commitment. So we had some best practices associated with that. Um, and so we're doing a community of practice session. We've done one with agencies. We're doing a second and we're deep diving into workforce and finances, et cetera. Um, secondly, we've created a lot of infrastructure, particularly with DHS, around the reviews of the agencies ongoing. So it couldn't be just a one, uh, you know, one-time effort. Um, we now uh, routinely and on uh, and monthly um, really meet and share provider information, um, look for those red flags, identify areas that we might have concerns about, and then really try to have a plan going forward. Um, we also review young people who are in inpatient or in settings that we're not, you know, um, where we want to move them on, and we're doing that on a, on a regular basis. Um, we also have found that, you know, we do have to have some uh, attention to restraints. Um, the Wordsworth death was as a result of a really uh, a poorly, uh, you know, poorly acted restraint. And so we have really seen some promising that the residential treatment facilities are a little different than, than a general it seems, it seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. So, so, so I'm ready. For I'm this ready challenge. for this challenge, and I was built, and I was for, built this. for this. I think that, I think we, that all have we all have a purpose in life, and mine and mine is going to take on a task that most that most of back away from, back away from. from. Back that impossible. What people, people say is impossible. I see possibilities. I don't see anything, I don't see anything as impossible. being impossible. Mentality, mentality, there are different, there are different mentalities, mentalities, but just like just there's like different, different ways to teach people how to, people how to there's, there's different, different ways to communicate. communicate.